These are a couple of very cheap bench stones. And by cheap, I mean you can often find these for as little as one or two dollars. So they're a great choice to have for low cost, which means you can have a spare one pretty much anywhere. And in fact, I like to have them always on hand because I use them for gifts, because every now and again someone will come over You'll be talking about knives or sharpening. You'll do a quick demonstration. They'll get interested enough that they'll want to sort of sharpen on their own. But of course, a $100 sharpening stone might not be the best choice for someone who's just learning. They may never even uh, continue on with it. But what's the investment of a dollar or two dollar stone? The main difference in the stones is the basically the binder content because they're almost always made out of the same abrasive, which is aluminum oxide. The softer stones, like this, a lot of people look down upon them because they do wear much faster. But the reason that they wear is because they're constantly releasing fresh abrasive. And that gives you the fastest cutting and strongest edge profile. The reason that it's strongest is because a fresh abrasive grinds the metal. Worn abrasive stresses the metal. So the only weakness of the stones that essentially have a, a low binder content and release fresh abrasive is that you do either need to lap them on occasion or be more particular about where you use the stone as Murray Carter has talked about in his videos and don't just use it like this but concentrate on the ends and the sides to try to get equal wear. But again, they're, you know, one or two dollars. So if you do wear one out in a couple of years, it's not a tremendous investment. What I'm going to talk a bit about today is how to overcome the weaknesses in both of these stones. The main weakness to this stone, which has a very high binder content, is that it doesn't release fresh abrasive at all. So what happens if you need to actually grind a lot of material uh, in a hurry? Now there's a couple of things you can do, like you can use another stone to put some abrasive on this one, but that means you had to have another stone. Uh, you can get someone who's a mason to actually cut a set of tracks in the stone. Uh, and what that does basically is it produces high pressure ridges on the coarse side. But again, you had to know a mason who has a diamond saw uh, if they're a friend, they'll essentially do that uh, for free because it's a couple of tracks. But what do you do if you don't have any special equipment? And you have basically a knife like this, which is ironically called an Endora. That's the actual line of knives. And this is their, you know, carving, slicing knife. I've made a few modifications to this. I've put in a sharpening choil down here. I've taken out the recurve. I've adjusted the edge angle. I've straightened out the blade because there was actually a warp in it uh, in this region and I formed a clean point and rounded out the spine. So when I was first sharpening this and I had to adjust the edge angle and even it up, I went to use this stone. And again, using a variety of stones, always not the optimal stone, just gives you a bit more experience. And again, you know, keeps it from being uh, just work for me because it's always about experimentation and and learning. So what do you do when you need to remove a lot of material fast and you only have a stone like this that doesn't cut very well? Now what I'm going to show you is arguably a very abusive technique because it damages both the stone and can damage the knife. And it's a technique that you would never use on something like this. Uh, this is a very fine uh, Japanese blade it has a very interesting primary grind. Uh, this section up here is very lightly hollow. This is very lightly convex. This part down here is very lightly flat. And there's a very tiny uh, final edge bevel, uh, which is just about one thousandth of an inch uh, thick. So that the edge is very, very thin and at a very low angle. Uh, so you wouldn't want to use the technique I'm about to show you on this because it would actually damage the knife uh, severely. Now it will damage the knife no matter what knife you use it on, but essentially some knives you are willing to damage uh, when you need to get some metal removed uh, in a hurry. As a side note, this is white number one steel, uh, or often called white paper steel. It's essentially just a very pure high carbon 
uh, steel. Uh, one of the things that often confuses people the first time they're introduced to these knives is that the knife feels very sticky and it comes relatively dull. Uh, that's because they come coated with a lacquer on them because again the blade is a very high purity high carbon steel so it has no uh, corrosion resistance at all. So it's likely it would actually rust in the shipping process so they ship them with a lacquer. So if you actually try to use it as you get it the blade will feel very sticky, it will stick to everything in the kitchen just be not a pleasant experience. So you need to clean off that lacquer and then the very edge is usually sharp in most of the cases but it also has that lacquer on it and of course trying to clean the lacquer off the edge can be a bit of a, a health and safety risk so normally uh, all that I do is clean the lacquer off the blade and then whatever stone I want to finish on and with a knife like this it usually begs for at least a four to eight thousand grit finish take that stone and very lightly and it's usually almost instantly you just grind the lacquer off and the sharpness is there so back to say a knife like this I mean this is like a two dollar knife or you have this sort of beast of a machete from uh, Martindale and again these are a heavy use big blades they take damage uh, on a, a blade of this length and because it's relatively thin I mean this even one this one even has a slight warp here which is not that unusual considering the length of it and the thinness so it's not like you're going to be that concerned about a bit of uh, edge damage. Similar to something like this, which is an MT-151, uh, sort of Trailmaster inspired blade. Uh, I've used this one relatively heavily over the past uh, while. And as I use it and, and the edge gets a bit beat up from all the hard work, uh, it's the primary grind is thinned back out to keep the edge uh, at the minimum thickness to provide the maximum cutting ability, maximum efficiency and control. And over time it's developing this very, very light convex uh, sort of blend, which also gives you a little bit more curvature at the edge, which prevents that rapid torquing on a bad cut. So it lets you leave the edge just a little bit thinner. But again, with a knife like this, you can buy these for as low, I mean, as under 20 bucks. Uh, so if the edge does get a bit beat up and you need to remove some material in a hurry and again you only have a cheap stone So what you do is you use the corner of the stone and you can see the corners on this stone are Relatively worn to the point that you're starting to get that hollow scallop and of course the reason that the corners Make such a dramatic difference is because they amplify the pressure So if you look at around right here, you have a contact area of a few centimeters and if you sharpen like this with the knife sort of across the blade you can see you can stretch your contact area out to easily above five centimeters but when you're sharpening the knife on the corners and especially if you angle the knife so that you're always hitting the edge so I've created a flat here of about three millimeters wide so if I move the knife like this I'm now catching this new corner and as that wears I rotate it back and catch the other corner so I'm always making contact with an area of only about a millimeter or so. So in this case, I could have 50 millimeters of contact in this one millimeter. That's a 50 to one difference, which means the pressure is 50 times higher. That means you will cut 50 times faster. That's not an exaggeration. Using the corner of the stone, you can literally do in seconds what takes minutes on the flat. And what, if you spend a minute on this, it's like taking an hour on the flat. It's almost instantaneous, the dramatic difference that this makes in honing speed. Now, the reason why it's abusive to the stone is because the pressure is so high, it literally breaks the stone apart. Again, this is a very, very hard stone. Uh, it doesn't release abrasive at all if you try to grind on the flat. But when you're grinding on the edge, the pressure again is so high, it's literally like putting hundreds of pounds of force against the flat. The stone will just fragment and break apart and it will wear extremely fast. The other thing is that it mangles the edge in terms of stress. Again, you're putting tremendously high pressures on the edge. It would be like honing on the flat with literally hundreds of pounds of force uh, behind it. 
Uh, so again, it's a trade-off that you're using. The most sensible thing uh, to do is not bring the edge fully to the apex on the corner unless you really don't care much about the knife. So you take the knife and you distress it against the flat of the blade until all the chips, the deformations are gone and then you got that flat section on the edge. Now you take it to the corners and you start working and as soon as you start seeing the light really really thin out you stop and then you go back to the flats and you finish off and that will avoid really overstressing the edge because if you go right straight to an apex on the corners the actual apex will be full of fractured steel it will have a very heavy burr and you'll find it very difficult to remove now if it's a rough use knife anyway i mean if it's a knife that you're using for sod work and that type of deal what difference does it make sharpen it on the corners and only use it on the corners you're not looking for something to shave your face with uh, anyway the downside of this technique is that uh, because you're starting on a corner you obviously can't start right next to the heel of the blade because of course it'll catch so you'll tend to find yourself starting in front of the heel so if you're not careful you'll put a recurve in the blade so what you have to do of course is make sure that you grind just to heel itself relatively carefully and then work on the rest of the blade this also is only a technique that you tend to want to use on stones like this which are very hard and don't release a lot of uh, abrasive. If you try to use it on this, which is a relatively nice cheap stone, it will literally tear it apart. Like you'll actually put a great big scallop in this almost instantaneously. Again, this stone is soft enough that it will release fresh abrasive on the flat. If you try to grind into the corners, it will just peel the abrasive right off uh, the stone. So you can see there's a bit of a flat here, which is an experiment I did a while ago. And this is literally a couple of seconds work and it's already taken a huge strip uh, off the corner. So again, that's a technique for stripping a lot of material off an edge very quickly with a stone that generally doesn't cut very fast. Now, as an adjunct technique, what do you do if you're over to a friend's house and he gives you a knife like this, uh, very nice Japanese style blade, very, very thin edge, very, very low angle. Uh, it's relatively blunt, not damaged, just a bit blunt. And he gives you this stone and he asks you to sharpen the blade. Now, if you use uh, this stone relatively straightforwardly, you'll do more damage to the knife than sharpen it because even the fine side of this stone has such a low grit that it will just break the edge of the Japanese knife uh, apart. So what you have to do is reduce the force of the stone against the knife. And the way you do that is you maximize the contact area by using basically an almost as close to vertical stroke as you can find and be comfortable. So again, you'll see right here, I'm highly exaggerated. I've got about uh, at least 10 to 15 centimeters of contact area. You dramatically reduce your force so that you're just barely making contact around five to 10 grams. And the other thing is you keep the stone uh, very wet and you use a bit of dish detergent, just a little bit, which reduces the friction on the stone and allows the blade to glide over it uh, slightly. Again, I don't recommend doing this. This is not the ideal stone to sharpen uh, that style of knife. And in general, you don't need a very coarse edge on a knife like this, and you're wasting the geometry if you do put a very coarse uh, edge on it. But if you do have a relatively coarse stone, uh, that's what you do. Tilt the knife so that you make a tremendous amount of contact area that reduces the pressure. Really reduce the force that reduces the pressure. Make sure the stone is wet and use a little bit of dish detergent and that allows the knife to glide over it relatively easy. Both reducing the effective grit of the stone and also if there's any irregularities in the stone, the knife will tend to skip over it. As a last resort, 
if even those three steps don't work, you can use edge trailing motions. I generally don't like that because they're very prone to heavy burr formation. But using those three steps, you can dramatically decrease uh, the scratch pattern on any given stone. So in summary, those are two ways that you can take a stone and make it cut much faster than the grit or the binder will allow and you can take a stone and make it cut much finer than the binder or grit abrasive generally will allow. So it allows you to take a stone and use it to do heavy repairs or very fine sharpening even if the stone isn't ideal. And it's just a way to expand your toolkit. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy decent stones. I mean there are extra extra coarse diamond stones that rip material off very fast and there are extra, extra fine diamond stones that put a very fine edge on a blade. And there are also extra, extra coarse water stones that go all the way down to the double digits in terms of grit. And there's extra, extra fine water stones that go all the way up to, you know, uh, sub-micron grits. So if you have the time, inclination, and uh, funds, you can get much better stones. But you don't always uh, have those stones on you. You're not always going to pack them with you and a little bit of knowledge some ideas of physics and some basic experience you can learn how to use your stones over a much wider range of experience and be able to use the same stone to do a very fast and heavy repair on a huge great big heavy use blade like this to tune up a very rough use inexpensive knife and yes, even to do a very quick sharpening on a very fine edge precision cutting knife, again with the same very cheap stone by applying some basic laws of physics, by applying some technique and some skill.